Hello, BookTube, and welcome to Pentathon Week 2. <laughs> As you can tell from the name, Pentathon celebrates the fact that there are five Saturdays in September of 2018. And in celebration of this, Matt at Paperback Junkie put together what he calls the easiest flip and read along you'll ever do, <laughs> in which each, each of those weeks we are to indulge him by reading a sample of his favorite literature. <laughs> Uh, first week was Edgar Rice Burroughs. That was a treat. Uh, I could easily do Edgar Rice Burroughs all month. Uh, but unfortunately, into every life, a little rain must fall. And the second week is devoted to H.P. Lovecraft, uh, the author of the Cthulhu Mythos. Uh, an author I've never really liked. <laughs> uh, Matt loves him and knows his work inside and out. And, uh, and in a little bit of trolling Steve, I believe... Uh, on his latest, one of his latest Pentathon videos, uh, where he talks about H.P. Lovecraft, he actually appends a story. I was, I was wondering what I was going to talk about when it came to H.P. Lovecraft, when it came to the obligatory, horrible sojourn in hell that is the H.P. Lovecraft week of Pentathon. Uh, and Matt, ans he solved that problem for me by posting a story of H.P. Lovecraft on his channel, the text of it. And it was a little bit of trolling for Steve, because it's a story about cats. <laughs> so... H.P. Lovecraft was a was a crafter of horror stories. He was a a crafter of a mythos of, of dark undergods, and uh, he has been taken to the bosom of uh, dude bro readers and nihilists everywhere in the in the decades since he wrote. Uh, there's been all sorts of cod swallop written and said on BookTube about what a great guy he was and how he you know he was just. A member of a rollicking band of storytellers who just wanted to share each other's imaginative worlds and have some fun, maybe maybe drink a foamy beer on the weekends. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, Lovecraft looked and sounded like something from the Barrow Whites of Tolkien <laughs> and wanted very much every word that dropped from his pen to be considered religion, to be an article of religion. <laughs> And in order for it to have a chance like that, it would have to be considerably better, in my opinion, than it is. Uh, but authors live or die by their words, not by my words about them. So what we're going to do here for our Pentathon Week 2 is to read a little H.P. Lovecraft. I'm not going to try to imitate his, his stilted, droning, blood-drained New England accent. It, it, you want a New England accent? Come to Boston. You want a bad New England accent, the accent of some loveless spinster aunt who's, who's got two cats and disapproving opinions of everyone you've ever met, go to Rhode Island. <laughs> so I'm not going to try to imitate that. But let's read a little. The story that, that, that Paperback Junkie posted on his channel is The Cats of Ulthar. And we're going to read a little of it. We're going to see as far, we'll go as far as we can before the gorge rises and nausea threatens to stop us short. Shall we? So let's see. It is said that in Ulthar, which lies beyond the river Sky, no man may kill a cat, and this I can verily believe, as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring before the fire. For the cat is cryptic, and close to strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Egyptus, and bearer of tales from forgotten cities of Meroe and Ophir. He is the kin of the jungle's lords and heir to the secrets of Ori and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin, and he speaks her language. But he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that which she hath forgotten. In Ulthar, before ever the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats, there dwelt an old cotter and his wife who delighted to trap and slay cats of their neighbors. Why they did this, I know not save that many hate the voice of the cat in the night, and take it ill that cats should run stealthily about yards and gardens at twilight. But whatever the reason, this old man and his woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near to their hovel. And from some time, the sounds heard after dark, many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife, because of the habitual expression of the withered faces of the two, and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden from the spreading oaks at the back of a neglected yard. In truth, much as the owners of cats hated these old folk, they feared them more, and instead of berating them as brute assassins, they merely took care that no cherished pet or mouser should stray toward the remote hovel under the dark trees. 
When, through some unavoidable oversight, a cat was missed and sounds heard after dark, the loser would lament impotently and console himself by thanking fate, with a capital F, uh, that it was not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Ulthar were simple and knew not whence it is all cats first came. Getting harder, but we'll push on here. Uh, one day a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow, cobbled streets of Ulthar, Dark wanderers they were, and there, and unlike the other roving folk who passed through the village twice every year, in the marketplace they told fortunes for silver and bought gay beads from the from merchants. What was the land that these wanderers none could tell? But it was seen that they were given the stra to strange prayers, and that they had painted on sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies and heads of cats, hawks, rams, and lions. And the leader of the caravan wore a headdress with two horns and a curious disc betwixt the horns. That's just what you'd wear. Yeah. Uh, there was in this singular caravan a little boy with no father or mother, but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. I wonder where this is going. The plague had not been kind to him, yet had left him this small furry thing to mitigate his sorrow. And when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy, whom the dark people called Menes, smiled more often than he wept as he sate playing with his, case, his graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Ulthar, Menes could not find his kitten. And as he sobbed about in the marketplace, certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, and of the sounds heard in the night. And when he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation and finally to prayer. He stretched out his arms toward the sun and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand. Though indeed the villagers did not try very hard to understand, since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the little boy uttered his petition, there seemed from overhead the shadowy, nebulous figures of exotic things, of hybrid creatures crowned in horn-flanked discs. Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. Yeah, I see creatures corned in, hor crowned in disc horns all the time on Hyde Park Ave. You hardly talk about it anymore, it's so common. That night, the wanderers left Ulthar and were never seen again. And the, household, the householders were troubled when they noticed that in all the village there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth, the familiar cat had vanished. The cats, large and small, black and gray, striped, yellow and white, old Cranon, the burgomeister, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away in revenge for the killing of Menes's kitten and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Neith... The lean notary declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect, for their hatred of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, no one durst complain to the sinister couple. Even when little Atal, the innkeeper's son, vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulthar in that accursed yard under the trees, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, two abreast, as if in performance of some unheard-of rite of beasts. I'll just continue while all of you try to figure out how you pace to and fro in a circle. The villagers did not know how much to believe from so small a boy, and though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cats to their death, they preferred not to chide the old cotter until they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So Ulthar went to sleep in vain anger, and when the people awakened at dawn, behold! Every cat was back at his accustomed hearth. Large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow and white, none was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear, and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair and marveled not a little. Old Cranon again insisted that it was the dark folk who had taken them, since cats did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife. But all agreed on one thing that the refusal of all cats to eat their portions of meat and drink their saucer of milk was exceedingly curious, and for two whole days the sleek, lazy cats of Ulthar would touch no food, but only doze by the fire or in the sun. It was fully a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the widows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nith remarked that no one had seen the old man and his wife since the night the cats were away. 
In another week, the Burgermeister decided to overcome his fears and call the strange silent dwelling as a matter of duty, though in so doing he was careful to take with him Shang the blacksmith and Thule the cutter of stone as witnesses. And when they had broken down the frail door, they found only this, two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor, and the number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk among the Burgesses of Ulthar. <laughs> Somebody knows I'm talking about these hate, the hated enemy. <laughs> they love you, baby. They, they do. They love these appearances. <laughs> You've made me lose my place. <laughs> Zaf, the coroner, disputed at length with Nif, the lean notary, and Cranon and Shang and Thule were overwhelmed with questions. Even little Atal, the, the innkeeper's son, was closely questioned and given a sweetmeat as reward. They talked of the old cotter and his wife, of the caravan of dark wanderers, of small Menes and his black kitten, of the prayer of Menes and of the sky during that prayer, of the doings of the cats on the night of the caravan left, and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in the repellent yard. In case you've forgotten what you just read three seconds ago. <sighs> and in the end, the Burgesses passed that remarkable law which is told by traders in Hatheg and discussed by travelers in Nier, namely that in Othar no man may kill a cat. <sighs> Thanks to Paperback Junkie. That H.P. Lovecraft prose, prose which I'm, I'm sorry to tell you is typical, uh, is there for you all to read. And uh, in, in commemoration of our H.P. Lovecraft week of Pentathon 2018, let me give you my official benediction that if you read The Cats of Althar and you think, okay, well, that was at most a story premise and it was hysterically overwritten in a very, very bad pastiche of Edgar Allan Poe-style watery gothic, you have my permission never to read any more H.P. Lovecraft than just The Cats of Althar. Okay. Because no matter how much more of it you plow through, it's all going to be just as bad. Fortunately, there are many weeks left in Pentathon, <laughs> so we will reconvene next Saturday for far more enjoyable reading. <laughs> so, so next week is Robert E. Howard, the creator of Conan the Barbarian. So I strongly advise you all to go and get some Conan, pull it down off your shelf, go to your charity shop and buy a paperback, and enjoy yourself. You deserve it after this week. Thank you, Booktube. And I shall see you anon in the streets of Ulthar. <laughs>